I'm really delighted that uh, all of you made it here today. Um, so this is the book we're talking about today. Um, you know, when it comes to science and technology, I think a lot of us are willing to um, cede authority to experts. But when it comes to issues that seem familiar, which is society, culture, um, population, we are more likely to go with um, homespun wisdom, uh, <coughs> intuition, what we think is intuition, anecdotes from our small social circles, and rank prejudice sometimes. So I think uh, what this book really does is indirectly urge all of us to step back from instinctive ideas about many things that we have, uh, ideas about many things that we see around us, whether it's politics, society, culture, and to see whether what we are saying is really based on evidence and facts. And not just any kind of facts, but data, numbers. And, uh, you know, when uh, we, my sister and I used to argue, my father, who's here, he used to say, you know, uh, you're all arguing, but where are the facts? Or I all, do you belong to the category of people who say, I have my prejudices, don't confuse me with facts. So, I think that this is really... Uh, for people who don't want to be in that category, who really want to uh, nuance their arguments. And what I really liked about it is, it is that Rukmini has gone about it in a very calm, collected, it has a very calm, collected tone to it. And it covers a whole range of uh, areas of Indian life. And so it gives us a very uh, comprehensive view, uh, anchored in data, but it also kind of uh, reveals the limitations of the data. So it's not, it's not a, it, it sort of tells us what data can do and what, what it cannot do, what are the limitations. So I'm really delighted to be talking to her. Um, first, what I want to do is ask you, can you just talk to us about the landscape of data? There is, in, uh, you know, what are the institutions? Are they independent? Then what is government data? Then there's data being produced by non-profits, universities, private data so if you can just quickly tell us about the data landscape that y you know that you have tapped in your book um, thanks for that and i think uh, it's an important place to start because one of the things i keep trying to do and uh, you know want more people to do going forward is to always spend a couple of minutes in while talking about any data um, or you know the outcomes of it in a news story to give readers some explanation of where that data came from. Because I truly think that one of the reasons that people, that there's a sort of credibility crisis uh, in many things, but also in data, is because there is such a distance between the average reader, viewer, and the data. It seems like uh, they're being told to take someone's uh, opinion um, and they don't really know what the numbers actually say. So, so the more we can do to bridge this gap, I think the greater distance we can move towards building credibility in, in journalism, in, in numbers. Um, India's uh, statistical architecture is very much rooted in the uh, founding moment. It was a sort of uh, decolonizing assertion, the way India's statistical architecture was, was set up. So um, Mahalanobis, Nehru, their uh, vision for what uh, you know, the statistical architecture of India should look like at the moment of independence was audacious. It was far in, you know, the scale of its ambition was far beyond what a country at that scale, that level of uh, income and development had any right to be dreaming of right then. And it, what, it en what we ended up with was, at least in the early years, a statistical system that was the envy not just of the rest of the decolonizing world, but of parts of the developed world as well. Because we had, for example, the first large household sample survey anywhere in the world. And that architecture has in a way endured. It's the reason that we that we still have the National Sample Survey in, in the form that it is. So there is a vast, um, high quality 
um, architecture uh, of government produced data. And I do think it's important to make a couple of points around this. One is that it is good data. You know, sometimes we, we, we take skepticism to the point of blanket suspicion about everything. Um, some when one government is in charge, some when the other government is in charge. And what it leads to is a sort of feeling that there's no good data, nothing can be trusted, um, and we can't believe anything that comes out of this government or that government. I think it's important to know what, that, uh, what the statistics are rooted in so that we have some sense of why it is that we believe in it. Don't believe the numbers because I'm telling you to. Believe the numbers because they come out of this, you know, pedigreed institutions and follow international conventions. And there are thousands of people across the world paying very close attention to the numbers that do come out from India. So there is that, you know, vast body of government produced data, which includes uh, the census, the sample survey, um, you know, uh, data from various ministries, health data. And of course, we will and should uh, debate uh, what's happened to it, quality, uh, frequency, all of that should be debated, but this is what exists right now. Uh, additionally, what we're seeing, especially in the last, I'd say five to 10 years, is an explosion of private data sources. Now, these are extremely high quality, uh, but they are essentially close to public access. So we now have, in India, the world's largest uh, longitudinal panel survey, which means surveyors who go back to the same households uh, every three months and ask them a range of questions on everything from health to you know, uh, consumption to economic indicators. This is CMI's um, Consumer Pyramid Household Survey. It's private, as it should be. I mean, they built it as their private um, IP uh, to provide a value to, to uh, private companies. So we don't, I mean, I don't necessarily argue that this should be entirely public, but so we have this uh, explosion of extremely high quality private data, and it brings up a sort of um, tension because what's happening is that uh, academics across the world, companies, even people like the World Bank, uh, you know, I just saw a new report that they put out on um, informal enterprises. The, one of the largest data sources they've used in that is the CPHS, CMIE's data, which isn't available to, to you or me. And it raises the question about whether we should be seeding uh, you know, core elements of data collection to private agencies or be putting greater pressure on the government to deliver on those. So there's that. And additionally, uh, something that's happened particularly in the last couple of years is a sort of uh, uh, a third post, which is no, these are not people producing numbers, so they're neither government nor private, but they are people doing a great job of aggregating numbers and making them publicly available. So in the pandemic, for example, we had a, an entirely pro bono volunteer-driven effort called COVID19India.org. These were young uh, people typically who worked in tech, completely anonymous, completely pro bono, who on a telegram group got together and said, hey, we don't know what national numbers look like. Every state is putting out its state bulletin. Let's put it all together. And did that and made it a public good freely available. Uh, there's many other such examples of these sort of public spirited tech minded people who, are, uh, who have rapidly increased access to data, even if they're not producing it. So these, these are the sort of three key pillars of Indian data as I see it at the moment. Um, yeah, now that you brought up the COVID example, what was the gap in um, data that this, uh, this sort of public spirited endeavor was trying to fill? So there, were, there are two elements to it. One was, uh, as one was what COVID19India.org did and what COVID19 Bharat, its successor.org now does, which is that State bulletins were available, are available on each state government's website, Twitter handle, Facebook page, WhatsApp group for journalists, in these sorts of dis dis you know, organized ways. Um, but the central ministry, union ministry, for reasons I really do not understand, because I cannot sort of directly see some gain to not putting it together, does not put together all of these state bulletins. They only produce uh, state level numbers, not district level and not historic. So it means that if I wanted to see what's happened in Mumbai over time, um, I would have to go to the BMC's website. But there were many others who produce, for example, the state of UP was putting it out in a, a PDF on a WhatsApp group of journalists, so not available to the general public. So that was trying to solve the problem of aggregation. But the, the sort of bigger problem going on into the pandemic was that 
it was clear that official numbers were missing a large number of deaths. It was, you know, amp it was quite clear in the first wave and sort of abundantly clear to anyone in this country in the second wave that there were large numbers of people who were dying of COVID who were simply not being counted. Uh, so there, there the work then began to be a sort of combination of essentially whistleblowing work um, because th these were numbers that were being collected by the government but were not being put out, um, as well as uh, efforts to do things like file RTIs or even do things like uh, look at uh, physical records in hospitals and you know put that together. So um, multiple journalists across the country, many of them working in um, non-metros and non-English news newspapers where the risks and dangers are that much greater. So it's that much braver to attempt that than you know me doing it sitting in Chennai, um, did this sort of work across the country. And then the tech spirited sort of uh, role to fill there was again to aggregate it. So we all put it up on a publicly available website. And then that became the raw material for um, academics to produce uh, national estimates and for the WHO as well. So yeah, so this is, a, I suppose, a more short term problem where this government in particular was not putting out uh, some of the data. So let, let me just jump into one thing over yeah. there because it does sort of, you know, cut at the heart of uh, what happened with COVID deaths and why we didn't have the accurate data in a way cuts to the heart of legacy issues with Indian yeah. data that uh, that sometimes get missed um, uh, and are important to, to restate. So we know that the WHO estimates all India, which built on work of the sort I was mentioning, <laughs> Uh, says that there were 5 million deaths from COVID at the end of the second wave, while India's official numbers were 5 lakh at the time. So that's a 10x underestimate. And, um, uh, you know, there was huge outrage about it, and it became a sort of international incident. But in 2017, for example, India's official um, uh, death count from malaria was 192 deaths, while modeled estimates for the same year put it at 50,000 deaths. So that's a 40x uh, underestimate that never made it to any news at all. Uh, you know, we have Vidya Krishnan in the audience who's worked um, uh, on um, tuberculosis, yeah. who has, who is, uh, you know, among the people who has pointed out the huge um, gaps in counting uh, 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 cases and deaths from tuberculosis. Now, I just want to break down, and there'll be different issues with, uh, with TB, but I want to break down some of the issues of why this happened with COVID. So one of the things is we miss deaths from all diseases, as I'm saying, we miss right. from malaria, diarrhea, TB. Uh, the second thing is, you, you know, administrative systems were overwhelmed during the pandemic. And then we weren't counting suspected deaths. We were only looking at confirmed deaths, and it just meant that during the second wave in particular, getting a test was next to impossible. So you go in with these legacy issues, but then if you are um, sort of completely unwilling to accept that the numbers may be anything more than what you're saying, then you reach the unique situation we were in. So I, I want to make the point that uh, that there is a history to this up to right. a point, and then there are breaks in that history. So let's talk about both of those sure. uh, legacy issues and breaks in that. Right. So there are long-term issues, like you say, the legacy issues, and there are certain things that then exacerbated. I mean, the way uh, you know the government did or did not put out put out the data. So this is uh, sort of, so this, the data that we have, either on deaths or incidence of disease, I mean, can make a difference between life or death, right? So, I mean, this data is that important. I mean, it's really important for um, how we, uh, for policymakers uh, and what they do with the healthcare. And at the same time, I think you're, you've put out data which says that, you know, we spend like a pittance on, we don't have data and we spend a pittance on it and the ratio of, of medical uh, services to uh, the population is very low. So I think, uh, I think the book really does paint a pretty bleak picture of the situation in health. And we've heard from, from one, you know, the previous session on tuberculosis, how it plays out with one disease. And this is sort of, uh, you, so you can multiply it across you know, all uh, areas of health. So I just want to move to uh, uh, the next thing. This, so, so, so the reason I brought up health is because it, it concerns citizens' physical well-being. And uh, I want to move quickly to uh, employment and income because that relates to people's material well-being. 
And um, so I'd like to talk about employment, because work is uh, what gives you the income and allows you to live a life. And uh, so, um, you know, I'd like to talk about how, you know, the condition, from her book, the conditions of work in India across many parameters, whether it is, you know, uh, the security of work, the wages that are paid are among the worst in the world from what from the picture that she paints. And le le so let's focus on employment. So according to uh, the figures that you provided here, the employment is 5%, but it masks a whole lot of other... So that's pretty low. Unemployment. Yeah, unemployment, sorry. Unemployment is 5%. That's pretty low by global standards. But it masks a whole lot of other inequities and... Um, Problem. So can we just talk about what this figure masks? Sure. Uh, I think it's something you see in uh, poor countries across the world, which is that unemployment is essentially a luxury. It's, it's, a, it's impossible to not work when you are at the levels of uh, income that we're talking about here. So we, what, what's, you know, what that number is masking is things like uh, dignity of labor, of wages, of time, uh, hours spent in work. We have one of the highest rate uh, number of hours uh, spent on work uh, from across the world. So, so that number in itself, unemployment, um, masks all of the conditions under which people are working, uh, the work they would want, the work that will allow them the sort of mobility to to give their children, you know, education and jobs that that will not be of the sort that they've been, uh, you know. Um, uh, forced to forced to do so unemployment on its own as you point out is is not a great indicator what we do have uh, you know what we do should be looking a little more closely at is things like um, what are the jobs people do so this is one more of those things that I feel like if you asked um, so in Chennai where I'm from for example the sort of uh, you know standard newspaper narrative is around the IT worker right and it's almost I think the, if you asked a lot of people what is the most common job that people do? I think a lot of people would say maybe they work in IT in Chennai. And what you see uh, you know, across urban India, for example, is that construction labor is the top job for men, and domestic work is now the top job for women. And I don't think that these sort of facts from official national data have entered the public conversation really in, in the way that they should. Um, I also think uh, you know, one of the elements is uh, extremely low labor force participation rate of women. So unemployment is if you're you know already in the labor force and can't find a job, but so entering the labor force itself, which is saying that you are either working or available for work, India has one of the lowest levels of female labor force participation in the world, and it fell at a, uh, during a time when there was high growth. Uh, we don't really have a sort of complete answer for why this is. It's a combination, perhaps, of social norms that are still hard to push against for women to do paid work outside the uh, marital home. It perhaps also has to do with the quality of jobs that are being offered. You know, considering you have to negotiate things like um, safety, uh, childcare, um, uh, you know, wages. Uh, is it all worth it? Are these jobs that are worth it for women to leave the house? Um, you know, perhaps that is part of the uh, sort of explanation for why we are seeing these extremely low rates. But of course, the uh, you know mildly amusing part is that even though that unemployment uh, number is so low, unemployment number and hides so much, it was um, you know uh, a, a sort of sensitive enough number. For uh, for the government to essentially um, delay uh, for an entire sort of uh, over six months between the uh, during the 2019 election, so you know in in economic terms, it's uh, it, it seems like uh, it's not even capturing enough, but it was still sort of explosive enough to to s delay um, a, a national sample survey report, something that never happens. Yeah, so there have been some unprecedented. Uh, uh, policy decisions with respect to data. And I think this is, like, I think um, unemployment hit, like, a all-time low of 6%, which was just a 1%, but they were still sensitive enough. All-time high, yes. All-time high, yeah, sorry. Yeah. But, yeah, so it was still sensitive enough for them to delay it till after the elections and, yeah. So so this kind of explains the quality, the still poor quality of the, la the vast majority of jobs are 
extremely, uh, you know, um, you know, they don't pay well, the sort of long hours. And so then that segues into wages, you know. So it seems to me from your book that we are still a very, very poor country. And I say this because the whole dream of liberalization, the promise of liberalization and the rhetoric has been this mushrooming of the middle class. Um, so could we just talk about, you know, about this mythical middle class and actually people in the middle are actually extremely poor. So should you just give us a sense of that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the sort of um, data points from the book that, that goes down with the greatest difficulty, um, but is particularly important to sort of keep bringing home, which is there is a strong sort of narrative of victimhood that the, um, uh, that the among the richest in the country sort of like to wrap themselves with. Um, and the broad term that this victimhood is often given is middle class, that, you know, we are the middle class, we don't get, um, uh, we pay so much taxes, we don't get um, anything in return, there are no schemes for us. And invariably, the people making these arguments are extremely far from any notions of what uh, a truly middle of the middle class in India would look like. So in 2017-18, the last year for which we have consumption data, the numbers show that if you spent more than 8,500 rupees a month, if you spent more than 8,500 rupees a month in 2017-18, you were in the top 5% of urban India. Now, the people making this argument are most certainly, you know, sp probably spending 8,500 um, over two meals, let alone uh, over the course of the month. Um, so I think th we need to acknowledge that we have an extremely tiny, extremely loud, and uh, uh, sort of media and sort of socially dominant, uh, extreme, extreme rich class. It isn't just, it isn't even a, a rich, 10% or a rich 5%. It's an extremely small share of even the top 1% to which we all here belong um, that is extremely socially dominant and, you know, um, leads these sorts of conversations. Uh, the true middle class of this country, so even uh, people on like cooks and driver salaries, for example, who, who uh, the media would sort of like to think of perhaps as the middle class, would be within that top 5%. That, that is just how poor the rest the rest of the country is. So um, perhaps, you know, I, I am all in I don't necessarily mean that this, that, uh, you know, it means that we need to look at the sort of mathematical middle of the country for what a middle class is. If we want to think of it in more um, sort of uh, cultural uh, terms. Cultural terms, right. Yeah. So if we want to think of people who are saving for education um, uh, and, you know, prioritize education, that, that, that's, or there's the political science belief that a class that desires stability and, and you know, votes for law and order, that, that's a sort of, perhaps we want to think about that. If we want to think about uh, English-speaking people, perhaps that is, you know, some notion. So I think whoever wants to define the middle class, you know, if, if a big company needs to figure out who they think is the middle class to target their whatever new new product to they should they should define it for their own purposes but we should all be very clear that what we are talking about as a middle class is is very far from what the middle of the country actually looks like uh yeah but has it improved uh, uh, since 1991 have the numbers of the middle class improved after 1991 or is it remain stagnant or what because that was the promise of liberalization. So there is a broad growth in, um, uh, you know, incomes and consumption expenditure um, systematically over time, except potentially between 2011-12 uh, and 2017-18. Why I say potentially is because that is what the 17-18 numbers showed. However, that report was then withdrawn. And then the government has said they are now conducting a fresh round of it, which began in July. And hopefully when that comes out, we'll have the first consumption expenditure figures for India in, in more than 10 or, 10 or 11 years. But uh, uh, apart from that, uh, yes, there is a broad increase in uh, consumptions and incomes. And um, in terms of inequality, it does seem like that tiny vocal sliver that we're talking about has uh, increased their wealth at a far greater proportion, than, uh, far greater rate than the rest of the country has. Yeah, so, so basically we're still an extremely poor country. Yes. 
We are still an extremely yeah, poor and so you also say in your book that estimations of poverty have also there has been a stalling in, in measuring poverty. That's right. So, so what you, we yeah. have, in fact, most recently is a sort of fresh round of, uh, you know, some people are referring to it as the Great Indian Poverty Debate 2.0 because we had one version of this uh, 20 years ago. Uh, currently, we have sort of three big estimates from three different groups for what uh, poverty in India currently is at, which range from anything between, and I kid you not, they range from between 20% of the country to 0.7% of the country. The, that's the range depending on who you speak to. And the reason is because we haven't had a consumption expenditure survey. Same thing. India's okay. consumption expenditure surveys form the bedrock of our poverty estimates and as a result of global poverty estimates because we contribute so much of the world's poor. So everyone is doing modeling and estimates depending on uh, uh, assumptions that range from traditional to uh, pretty out there, which is why it takes you from 20% to 0.7%. And just as you can imagine, the usual suspects are saying 0.7% and the usual suspects are saying 20%. Mm -hmm. it, it, it breaks down on very much predictable lines. Okay. Um, another thing that uh, people often say, I mean, this is like, again, homespun wisdom that all of our problems, whether it's poverty or it's the lack of health care, it's all because of the population and how it's burgeoning. And again, you break those myths and say, actually, that firstly, it's very different across the country. And even overall, that's not really the case. So could you just talk about first the overall picture and then a little bit of the regional differences? Yeah, the, this conversation and, you know, because we still in 2022 in India, right from the top levels of government are still having the um, overpopulation, need to control population sort of uh, discussion. It's really a reminder of how far national conversation is from the data and from the global conversation around this, which has moved away from fears of overpopulation uh, years ago based on very good data, not based on a sort of political uh, calculation or decisions. We, uh, you know, the, the uh, fertility rates among women have been systematically declining just along all expected lines. Nothing is a surprise to any Indian demographer. It's moved just as expected to the point that we are now near replacement, which is we are at, at uh, roughly 2.1 uh, a total fertility rate of 2.1, which means a woman uh, today can be expected to have 2.1 children in her sort of lifetime, which means that's just enough to sort of replace the population. Of course, it'll take a while for population to stabilize, but that's where we are right now. Parts of the country have fallen far below the replacement rate, rate and they've been below replacement for decades now, which, which we've not paid enough attention to. The urban areas of pretty much the whole country are far below replacement. Um, and this isn't just your Kerala, Tamil Nadu, where you would anticipate this. This is even Kolkata, for example, where the replacement, the fertility is far below two. And any demographer uh, looking at these numbers anywhere in the world would say that this is time to start having an aging and depopulation conversation. When, you, when parts of your country are systematically under replacement, you need to start thinking really quickly about what's going to happen when you simply ha do not have enough people to be doing the jobs to sort of drive the economy, to produce the, uh, the, the, uh, the money that's going to take care of the young and uh, the elderly who are going to become sort of a, a ballooning share of, of the population. Instead, what we're having is an extremely... Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, anti-Muslim uh, sentiment-driven uh, conversation around population. So, uh, you know, uh, the sort of argument continues to be that Muslim fertility is very high, Muslim population is growing very fast, and, you know, something needs to be done about it. This is something you hear from top elected officials uh, publicly stated too. Although, again, here the data shows that Muslim fertility has fallen on completely expected lines. Anywhere in the world, when women get richer, have better access to health and education, they have fewer children. It's just an absolute no-brainer. And to think that, uh, that that would, for some reason, not happen in India can only come from a place of, uh, you know, from bigotry. There's, there is no other uh, way to sort of dream that this is a future uh, that will happen. So we, we see, for example, that Muslim women in the richest parts of the country, in Kerala and Tamil Nadu, 
have fewer children than non-Muslim women in the poorer parts of the country. It has to do with being richer and with, being ha with having access to better health and education. So we actually see that Muslim fertility fell faster than anticipated and faster than it did for other groups, um, all of which makes it very clear that fertility across all parts of the country and age groups will at some point in the future converge and you know, uh, nobody needs to be bringing in two child um, uh, norms, uh, uh, you know, neither coercive nor um, uh, punitive. In fact, the only sort of impact of such things, and we know this from published work, is to worsen the gender, uh, uh, you ratio. Know, uh, gender ratio. That's what immediately happens when you bring in these sort of enforced two child norms um, across the country. So it's, um, you know, it's an example of having a national conversation completely divorced from the numbers which is what, what's happening right now. A, a demographer put it to me as, why does Tamil Nadu still have a family planning section in, the in its health ministry? Why does it not have a department of aging? And this is something we should be asking nationally. Why do we still have family plan? You know, we need to still keep providing contraceptive access to women who don't have it. And yes, there are millions who still don't have it. That needs to happen. But um, why we're not focusing uh, more on aging when we've seen, for example, the pandemic put into such sharp focus uh, the, the, the figure of elderly couples who live by themselves. We saw this in Kerala, we saw it in other parts of the country. It's, a, it's an entire demographic that's been um, uh, ignored entirely until now. Yeah, so <coughs> basically uh, this first part, I wanted her to give us an idea of where, we, where this country stands and what the data tells us about our physical well-being, our material well-being, and to demolish the myth of population being a very big factor in this, and to ask her then, when the situation is so bleak for the majority of Indians, why do they not vote, as the data in her book shows, on the basis of uh, these material conditions? Why are voters not uh, choosing based on what parties do in terms of improving their material conditions in terms of health and their livelihoods. And, and she, first, first I want her to tell us on what, you know, what the voting data actually tells us so that we get an idea and then we can explore why perhaps they may not be uh, you know, as um, um, sort of uh, alert to their livelihood and um, health issues as a whole lot of other issues. So what, what is the, the voting data essentially says that, uh, like you say, you know, religion is a big issue, uh, caste is still a big issue, and we, yeah, so can you just, can you, yeah, uh, sort of give us a nuanced picture as uh, that, uh, that you have painted in your book? So I'll start by saying that um, one of the reasons we do not so far have or rather we've done the Indian voters a huge disservice for decades by having a sort of, by characterizing voters voting and their compact with politicians in, in, in the ways that we have is because I believe a lot of this understanding is based on pretty mediocre data. And the reason the data is mediocre is because it is en entirely based on opinion polls. So why is someone voting for somebody? across the world can only be derived from opinion polls. You, you, uh, it's not sort of election results, it's opinion polling. Uh, that in and of itself should not be a problem because a well done opinion poll should be a sort of representative sample of people and then you know, uh, gets it from them. But uh, I, I think we've, we've, we've had pretty, you know, a serious sort of deficit in our opinion polling so far. F to start with, the incentives for opinion polling are pretty messed up because, first of all, almost all election-related or sort of uh, politics-related opinion polling is commissioned by um, media houses who want to know who's going to win the next election. It's it's almost like wanting to know the cricket score. Like the you right. know the wanting to know the processes behind it is is not particularly uh, the incentive of the media organization paying for it. There are also many of these uh, uh, polling agencies are pretty opaque about their funding and their methodology. So while many journalists know that the same pollster 
uh, does work for a political party and for the media house and sometimes is doing one poll and producing results for, for two clients, one of which is the media and one of which is political parties, none of this is sort of, uh, you know, clearly disclosed. So, so, so the, this is the building block that it's coming from. And even the more uh, relatively uh, academic-minded opinion polling, I believe has uh, suffered from a lack of ambition and sort of lack of application of mind in asking questions. So one of the ways that we've tried to uh, answer the question of are people voting for issues or are, are people voting on caste and religion lines is by simply asking voters what is the top issue for you for the next election. And for the last 60 years, voters have said uh, jobs and employment, while election results go in all sorts of different ways, often having nothing to do with an em employment. So as yeah. we talked about employment in 2019, we know it hit unemployment hit a 45-year high, and the incumbent party at the national level was re-elected. So if right. you take people at face value when they said jobs mattered the most, how is it then they re-elected the incumbent? Correct. Um, and I think this sort of uh, quality of questioning as well as um, sort of inbuilt virtue signaling that you almost demand from people answering the questions right. means that um, th that that you know th that question is almost pointless. I, I really don't know why we ask that anymore to ask people directly what's the top issue on your mind. Um, so you have that, and then simultaneously you'll have other surveys which uncover things like. 45% uh, of people in a big national representative survey said that they would want uh, uh, the, their MP or the representative for their constituency to be from the same caste as them. And then you have to sort of put those together to try and understand what are people really voting for. So, so, so what we have right now is multiple sort of disparate sets of information that to me don't necessarily add up to a whole. But I think that's okay. What they add up to is two things. One is that single opinion polls are not telling you enough. And two is that let's not assume that people are voting on single issues. Uh, they may not even know what they say they are voting for, particularly if we ask the questions in this way. So there is a pretty complicated ma matrix of uh, decision making, um, and we are doing a pretty bad job of capturing it. One sort of stylized fact that we don't talk about enough, but that is relatively well uh, borne out through the data, is that we never characterize Indian voters as driven by ideas and ideologies. We, we characterize in them in much more um, uh, sort of primitive ways. We cra characterize them as uh, people who will sell their votes uh, for, for a biryani and a bottle of rum. Um, but what the data actually shows is that um, Indian voters are remarkably ideologically consistent. Voters are for the two uh, you know, key political parties or political sides have uh, systematically supported the same issues uh, consistently um, you know, over decades. This is the sort of analysis that people would do with, say, the two key parties in the US, for example. You'd, you'd identify these as Democrat issues and Republican issues. But we never assume these things about Indian voters, and we never assume these things about Indian parties. We, we sort of talk about them as all the same. Voters don't see them as the same. Voters are very clearly consistently identifying with a party and also identifying on some key hot button issues. So, um, you know, uh, th the fact that people might vote for um, what might seem against their self-interest or might vote for someone who they say belongs to the caste or religion that they are from, uh, I think we'd be doing a disservice here too by sort of chalking it down to, uh, to a sort of simplistic um, uh, understanding. To a person from a historically and con continuing a marginalized background who faces substantial social discrimination and sort of humiliation on a daily basis to say that they don't believe that the Indian state will deliver goods equitably to everyone and hence they would like to support a person who they feel will at least on that grounds deliver benefits to them is extremely rational. So right. um, that doesn't mean that that is the reason for voting for for your caste member across caste groups. I don't, I don't think that's one explanation. But I don't think voting on caste or religious lines necessarily 
should be flattened into into a very simplistic reading as well. Um, uh, you know, luckily I don't have to come up with the answers. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I'm left with the feeling that um, uh, that we've not got to the meat of it well enough. We've got all these, we've got the tail of the elephant and the trunk of the elephant, but we've not been able to put it together to figure out it's an elephant yet. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll just ask you one more question because when you say they, they are voting on ideas, it's usually not economic ideas. You know, it's not as though one party is saying, we should spend X amount, we should have a more social welfare state. The other one, you know, it's not a, the, the ideological positions are usually not very strongly economic. They are more, and I'm just wondering, because in all your, you have a couple of chapters on the social attitudes of Indians. And so could you just, I'm just wondering whether that plays our social system and uh, the, our uh, rather conservative ideas about, uh, you know, religion, caste, whether that, you know, also plays a role in why uh, issues of livelihood and health are not at the center of public discourse when it comes to elections. So one, one economic issue that is uh, strongly political is uh, reservations because in a se I mean it is both a social issue and an economic issue and there there are uh, parties with clearly identified positions and voters with clearly identified positions as well and that is a st an area of strong ideological correlation you see people systematically vote for the same parties that they you know uh, believe support or oppose uh, the position that they feel according um, to their own beliefs on social issues um, you know I'll take the first part of it separately which is yes I do think you know among just as we we've not allowed this we built this myth of the middle class we've also uh, and uh, when I say we I would say the sort of um, uh, you know India's liberals have for a long time uh, built a myth of a, a progressive and tolerant um, a majority and particularly of a progressive uh, youth the data has for a long time shown that this is not the case. The data has for a long time shown that majorities of people in this country do not want a person of another caste or another religion as their neighbor, let alone their son or daughter-in-law. Uh, in some surveys, majorities of people have said that they support laws opposing inter-caste and inter-religious marriage. And they feel okay to say this to surveyors. You know, add a few percent of people who don't feel it's okay to tell a surveyor but still feel that. So. Uh, I don't, you know, when the data has shown this for a long time, uh, I don't think oh, th that, uh, I mean, it's irrational to have this sort of sudden realization that, that this is what uh, things look like. Uh, the data has also systematically showed that young people do not profess more progressive um, positions than older people. Uh, they neither profess those positions nor do they walk the talk. So the share of intercaste marriage among people in their 20s is no different from people in their 90s. It is unchanged across uh, Indian independence. Um, uh, you know, so th there is no reason to sort of, uh, I mean, w this, w this was a myth that, uh, this was wishful thinking. And wishful thinking can be can be dangerous when when you truly start to believe it, as I think many people did until uh, reality sort of smacked them in the face <laughs> recently. Okay, I think I'll have to begin Q and A. Although um, I think you'll have to buy the book to really um, get all the nuances, and there's a lot more that we could speak about, um, especially about the importance of data for democracy which is what this whole book is about. It's about how citizens must demand good data, must, I mean, it sort of alerts us to this dimension of democracy. And because that's what policies are based on. And um, so, yeah, so we can take questions now. Just, can we just have questions, not comments, and one question per person? Yes, please. A big appreciation to work in data. Uh, you know, it, I know it's so difficult to do it. I guess three data points which you would want to share, which really shocked you, and you would want us to hear about. Okay, um, three data points. Um, okay. No, 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 no. I'm sure I won't pick the three best ones, but I'll do, do the three that come to mind anyway. One is that 
the share of intercaste marriage is 4%. 4% of marriages are, are intercaste. Um, then, uh, to me, that um, the malarial, malarial deaths one is, you know, it tells so many stories at one go. So, so that's a telling one. Um, let me see, I should have at least something that's nice, right? It shouldn't all be, <laughs> all be depressing like this. Uh, what's a relatively... Well, okay, here's a relatively positive one, which is that the share of Indians who say that they're not opposed to uh, homosexuality has substantially improved um, over the years. I say improved because it's a value judgment since I support it. Um, increased over the years um, to... Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a, it raises the question of can the law drive change in values or does the law sort of reflect change in values? So that's one sort of hopefully positive number. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the present government particularly, perhaps earlier governments also, are always accusing, you know, when it is uncomfortable data, they're, they're trashing the methodology, okay? So how much can the, and they have also, use methodology to deny earlier de government data, et cetera, and change methodology. So how much does methodology influence the final data? How important is that? And how easily can it be manipulated? That's a fantastic question. Um, and really Thank sort you. of, uh, really um, an area that requires great vigilance and sort of continued vigilance no matter which government or, or where we stand uh, you know in relation to that government uh, methodology and changing methodologies is uh, uh, you know can change outcomes entirely it it's it's uh, uh, sort of integral to to numbers to understanding them and to the outcome so just as an example what happened with the consumption expenditure, you know, the survey came out, it showed that real incomes had, or real consumption had declined for the first time in decades. And the government said, had some objections to, to the methodology. Now, um, those can be debated, and those were long-standing um, objections, you know, the, uh, long-standing problems with how we count consumption in India. So what the government has done now, so they, they refused to publish that, uh, survey. What the government has done now is that they've come out with a new survey in which one of the changes in the methodology is that they are uh, asking the uh, you know fewer questions at one go because this, the list had become very long, um, and there, it raises the question of whether that is going to change outcomes. We don't know, and um, sort of the uh, the solution to a lot. Of, first of all, it's great that. When these things are known, and I, you know, uh, really value all the academics and journalists who keep a close eye on this sort of stuff and put it out, so that uh, when it comes out, you can be sure that the EPW will, uh, you know, there'll be months of the EPW of discussions about this change in methodology in the EPW. But there is a sort of spirit of um, innovation and trying things out that's valuable. That perhaps we we should take from this. Um, in the 1930s. Uh, before we had ever set up our first household survey, uh, Mahalanobis was trying to convince, and the ISI in general, were trying to convince people of, of the value of sample surveys. And the Bengal presidency at the time was uh, stuck with this intractable, intractable problem, which, by the way, we've still not solved, about estimating crop yields. And it's, it's important. You need to know how much jute you're going to expect in that year, depending on, you know, uh, the plot sizes, all of that. So what they did is that they had an open com competition. One group, uh, the, the sort of government department, could continue doing it as they'd always done, which is a plot by plot method. And this newfangled sample survey that ISI was trying out, they said, you guys also try it out. And what ended up happening was that the sample survey came closer to the real number than the plot by plot census. And it, it did a great job of making the case for a sample survey. So with this change in methodology, one of the arguments has been, why didn't we pilot it? Why didn't we try it out as a pilot before doing this? Um, and one, one thing that's happening is that a lot of state governments are now interested in doing more with data because they feel that you know they don't get enough of it. So maybe we should think of ways to fostering more of this spirit of innovation. Like state governments can try out their own thing and see, see what does better, especially with these changes in methodology. The, the, the flip side to it is vigilance. You need to be vigilant about the, and also transparency. If you change the methodology, you have to be open about that. Can you hear me now? Okay. So um, you mentioned that opinion polls aren't uh, 
exactly accurate in terms of capturing voter psychology and sentiments, right? So can you point us to some examples, maybe in the Western world, where you think they've structured opinion polls a bit more accurately, and that's kind of informed the public discourse a bit better? Great question and very sort of live um, uh, discussion and examples around it because of the US midterm elections that's happened right now. So, you know, th there are ways to think about how to make opinion polling better. And there have been examples of that in India as well. One of which is to just not ask direct questions. You get to the answer uh, in roundabout ways. Sometimes you ask people to list things. Sometimes you ask the quest same question in two different ways. And then you figure out what are sort of stated and revealed preferences. You might have stated one thing, but you, s you said that you're not OK with it. But in another question, you've revealed that you are OK with it. But what the US does, for example, is very, which is very valuable, is that they accept uh, some, uh, you know, many media uh, or sort of uh, experts in this, accept that some polls are biased in one way or the other. So what they do now is create a sort of model which corrects for this. So they'll say uh, poll A always gives extra seats to the Republicans. So let's put minus three for them. This is how much they usually are off by. Uh, this poll always gives extra to uh, Democrats or always, you know, gets something, so, th so they discount for that. And the result of that is a much more accurate uh, model. But what that depends on is full transparency in among all those pollsters uh, so that you are able to make these corrections. So, you know, if we can fix the underlying information, right now polls are totally opaque. They'll just, you, you see it on TV, you don't actually get, the numbers at all. So if we got greater transparency in that, then perhaps people could think of building this like 538.com, those sorts of models, which would, um, uh, you know, as a result, the, the US midterm election predictions by pollsters who did this kind of modeling was extremely close to what, what ended up actually happening. Yeah. Um, that, that, OK, yeah. Yeah. Then that that yeah. that uh, so I just have a question on your like views and thoughts on Indian democracy going forward. You know, given the data you present on the stagnating sort of illi illiberalism of the youthful uh, people in India, but also the fact that voters don't vote purely based on religion and caste, and it's it, it is a wide variety of issues. So, what are your thoughts on that? Your hopes and fears for Indian um, democracy. So I think one of the things we have to be sort of quite uh, clear about is that change change will not move along uh, predicted lines. So there has been a sort of assumption that it, as India gets richer, more urbanized, more westernized, uh, younger people will sort of gravitate to to sort of global notions of progressive views. And I think we've seen for a while that that's not happening. So we need, first of all, a, a different uh, political science model of analyzing uh, opinion changes in India because it isn't moving along uh, sort of lines that uh, that other theorists would expect it to move on. We, we need to understand that separately. Um, I do still think that uh, that elections are very much a sort of contest of ideas and um, uh, you know uh, ultimately how how uh, progressive positions are phrased and how they are uh, how made to connect uh, with people, including younger people, uh, is uh, is a, is a challenge for those who want sort of greater uptake of those um, of that. And I think you know one thing we really want to think about is if if we feel that there should be if there is consensus that there should be a broad sort of uh, uh, progressive. Um, you know, agenda. I'm not talking about political parties here, but if we want to say that at least, can we move to a place where everybody agrees that marrying whoever you want is okay? We've not even got to the place of uh, sort of building consensus around that. And then if we do, we need to think about actual ways to make that happen. Wh where does the conversation need to happen? Does something need to happen in schools, in colleges? How is this going to happen? If we assume that it's going to happen on its own, that's not happening. So if we want to make it happen, then we're going to have to come up with ways to make it happen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, traditionally, the world over, a progress of a nation is measured by the GDP. OK? But we have seen how the GDP figures have been manipulated and uh, you know fudged and all that. And we also have the case of uh, Bhutan, where they measure, they 
they sort of assess the, the country's health in terms of a happiness co quotient. Okay, so can we, do you think such a system can be adopted here in India? So I am personally not in favor of the happiness uh, index. I, I don't think it's a, um, meaning on uh, uh, statistical grounds, I don't think it's a good uh, index. It's an, I'm not opposed to happiness. <laughs> <laughs> it's I just it's qualitative, <laughs> I know. Yeah. I just don't think it's a very good uh, index. Uh, on the GDP, I just want to, uh, you know, um, sort of make one distinction, which is that there are problems with the new series of the GDP, which have been, and this is a point I want to repeatedly make, the reason we know any of these issues with the data, the, the surveys that were suppressed, the problems with the GDP, is because of Indian journalists typically working within mainstream organizations. So the sense that journalism is doing nothing and you know fully bought over, it just means that we're that we're spending too much time watching or reading the wrong people because <laughs> a lot of people have brought all of this out. So, so the the work around the GDP was led by um, a journalist named Pramit Bhattacharya who was at the min at the time. And there too, I think it sort of links to the earlier question around methodology, which is, it isn't a question of fudging or lying. There have been diff changes in the methodology, and let's debate those. Um, I don't think. They're all bad, you know. Some of those do follow a sort of global change that's going on in in uh, uh, measuring the GDP, and um, uh, you know it needs discussion and debate. Um, and I don't think you know even even its greatest critics would say that it's it's a sort of pure attempt at fudging it. If we don't fix the problems that were pointed out by the journalists going forward, then sure that's a problem, and you know um, uh, something to to. to to talk more about, um, uh, I don't. Yeah, so as I suppose, other indicators that would be useful include things that uh, like um, there's been an attempt at this multi-dimensional poverty index, uh, which tries to look at uh, not just income poverty but uh, deprivation around along multi multiple sort of indicators. Um, I think a lot of employment and wage-related uh, information is useful. In fact, I really think wages is one of the uh, most uh, uh, sort of valuable indicators. Uh, we don't have enough good data on it, but wages would be a, it seems like a no-brainer, right? If if wages were, were go going up and, you know, sort of good across the board and sort of uh, uh, related well with uh, education and other sort of human capital measures, then then those are all good signs overall for the economy. So, um, expenditure is the one we rely on right now. Uh, uh, again, th there are sort of Debates about methodology. Hmm. I'm I'm here to chat for. Yeah. for yeah. So sure, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Correct. Outlandish figure yeah. from the point of view of EWS. Right. We talk about X number of people paying income tax. When you look at consumption levels, and I'm just saying anecdotally, yeah. you do see a lot of people, your own people, spending a lot more than what they are earlier. Right. People do want to send their children to good schools and somehow they manage it. You know? yeah. So I'm saying it's all very confusing. So my question to you, please help us to clear this fog I'm not talking about which survey or anything, but yeah. I'm just trying to get a feel as a citizen that how exactly, how should we look at poverty or in happiness, and what should be the, what is the trend really like? This is all your experience. No, you know, I really think it's important what you've asked, and it, um, I share this feeling of yours, and I think many people here will share it, which is how do we know what's going on? Where should we look? It, it seems like a fog right now. and you know, the, many people feel this way, and it sort of points to me to a huge failing um, among communicators of data, journalists included, 
uh, for on two, three counts. One is we don't explain where numbers come from properly. So the reason that things like this income tax or consumption seem so outlandish, how can it be that the top 5% spends 8,500 rupees a month when everybody you know is spending that much on one dinner? The reason it seems like that is because, first of all, we do not we do not explain where these numbers come from. So it seems like I'm sure that it seems like that must be lies. And we do not explain all that it misses. So why why is it that all, all of you know the rest of this exists? We don't help you fit the new information you get into the universe of what else that's there. It is a failing of people who've communicated data from the people who produce it to journalists. Um, uh, well, you know, all I can say, at least all I can say right now is that I'm trying to solve for this. Um, I do feel that the work of Indian journalists doing this or other communicators has not had a cumulative effect. We've not built cumulative knowledge and we've left people like you un unable to figure out where to go for this information. And it isn't out of people not trying to find out or willfully, you know, just caring about Bollywood and cricket. No, they don't know where to get this information for, from. So I accept this, this and I, you know, share this realization, which is something I'm trying to solve for in the future. And, you know, ho hopefully somewhere, uh, hopefully when we speak one year uh, down the line, you know, you, uh, hope, I don't know, the hope is for, the, for people like you to feel differently in the future. Also, this book, I must <laughs> say. <laughs> I do such the a bad whole job point of, of the book myself. is actually, I mean, it gets into the nitty gritty of, and it also tells you the sources and what the limitations might be. And so, it, I think, I think, I think, if it takes a lot of work for a citizen to, yeah. in a democracy, I really do feel. I think 